sends Lou 7-4 to the Philadelphia Flyers. 7-4. What stands out to you when you hear a 7-4 score? Track meet, maybe? At the end of the Leafs video, I warned the Sens about the Bruins' top line. They didn't listen, and they were torched. At the end of that video, I warned this team about turning that game into a track meet. I guess they couldn't listen again. I'm no NHLer, but everything I warn you against comes true. Pay attention! I make zero dollars to make these claims, you make millions! If I know it's coming, so should you! Having said that, it was a pretty fun and entertaining hockey game. But man oh man, if you don't tighten up defensively, this is going to be a long season. Of course, the only reason they were able to play that run and gun style is because they were having an excellent night offensively. Now I have to admit, coming into this season I was very pessimistic about this team. But the one thing I was very consistent about was that this team had better young players than people were giving them credit for. How are the young guys now? Thomas Shabbat is an Ottawa Senator. He's pretty good. Ditto for Maxime Lejoie. They couldn't possibly have anybody else. Oh yes they do! They got a guy with the best name in sports! A guy with the name... Brady! Brady Kachuk plays hockey in Ottawa! Brady Kachuk is a Sen! That's right. The guy that we were supposed to give up in the draft? He plays for Ottawa! There were times last night, he looked like a man against boys. He was unquestionably the best player on the ice for the first period and a half. Two goals, just over 21 minutes into the game I might add, and one assist. That's a pretty good night for a kid in only a second NHL game. His first period goal came three games quicker than Dad Keith, and two quicker than Brother Matthew. Drafted highest, scored fastest, WE GOT THE BEST Kachuk BABY! Heck, he was even up to typical Kachuk antics in the third trying to secure his first Gordie Howe hat-trick of his career. As it turns out, he just beat up an unwilling Scott Lawton. Speed, skill, toughness, and the willingness to go to the net? I love it. Something else I loved? Craig Anderson. With the Flyers on the power play, they started globetrotting the puck around the Sen zone. Drew, to Couturier, to Simmons. Not today! Simmons picks up the rebound. Get that garbage out of here! Craig Anderson kicks out his left leg and turns away two excellent Flyer scoring chances. The second one might have hit the post too. Lucky and good on that play. It was a huge play too, as a few minutes later, Kachuk showed his willingness to go to the net. With the Sens on the power play, Lejoie throws the puck in front, Tierney tips it, it bounces off Kachuk's skate, and in. He kicked that in. How the refs let that go is beyond me. I said at the time of the goal, that's going to be reversed. It wasn't. Brady Kachuk gets his first goal in the NHL, and the Sens lead 1-0. Then, 22 seconds later, Dylan DeMello gets a penalty for tripping. Don't do that. The Sens kill it off. No harm, no foul. This time. Five minutes later, Weidman goes to the box for hooking. Considering he took away a breakaway chance, it was the right move, but quit taking penalties. 39 seconds later, Giroud to Gosses Bear, clap bomb, Voracek tips in front. We're tied at one. Quit taking penalties. Aside from the taking penalties, not much blame to be passed around on that play. Sure, Voracek was wide open, but it was a power play. There's going to be somebody wide open on the play. But we go into the first intermission, tied at one. Early in the second, Brady picks up the puck at his own blue line and does it all himself. He wheels through the neutral zone, hits the Flyers' blue line, steps over the line, and rockets a wrister by Calvin Pickard for a second of the night. In case you forgot, Brady belongs to us! Ironic he would score just over a minute in the second, too, because I texted my buddy during the first intermission and admitted that his first goal was a kick-in and it probably shouldn't count. But, I said that he was looking really good and would likely score later in the game. Either way, he was going to score his first NHL goal last night. Well, send me back in time and call me Nostradamus. Brady with his second in just over 21 minutes, and the Sens are back in front, leading 2-1. to one. A few minutes later, another great name, Radko Gudas throws the puck in front. Anderson makes the save, but Sean Couturier picks up the rebound, tapping the puck into the empty net. That's another tough one. Anderson should do a better job of corralling that puck, but in the same breath, does anybody want to show any urgency and clear that puck? There was nobody tracking hard back to the front of the net. Tierney saw Couturier too late to react. Couturier tapped it in, and we're tied at two. A couple minutes later, Jakub Voracek goes five-hole on Craig Anderson on the odd man rush, 
and the Flyers have their first lead. Yikes. In the home opener, I spoke highly of a five-hole save Craig Anderson made on Jonathan Taves. This one? Uh, yeah. Anderson gave up a ton of those five-hole looking goals last year, and that Voracek goal looked a lot like that. Whether we see the Anderson who makes the save against Taves in Game 1, or the one who gave up the five-hole goal against Voracek in Game 4, it'll be interesting to see heading into the rest of the year. Either way, the odd man rush came because the Senators decided to play a run-and-gun style. The Flyers have too many offensive weapons to deploy that style of hockey. It's going to end up poorly if you continue to give them odd man rushes, and they learn the hard way this time. Fix the rush, and that goal doesn't happen. Then things get fun. Alex Formanton runs Oscar Lindblom into the boards from behind, away from the puck, and somehow gets away with it? The Flyers get angry and retaliate, and somehow the Sens get a power play out of it? Whatever. We'll take it. A minute into the power play. Bodker finds Brady. He throws a blind backhand pass in front. Tierney tips it to Lejoie, who finds the back of the net for his second of the season. 3-3. It was a bit of an interesting setup on the play, with the Sens having four guys standing in front of the net in a square by the time the puck goes in. But hey, it worked. We'll take it. And we're tied back up. The team couldn't keep things tied for long though, as Scott Lawton picked up a Dale Weiss failed wraparound attempt and tapped it into the empty net to give the Flyers their second lead of the night. That's another tough one. The puck goes through Shabbat's feet as he was covering the front of the net, but because he was standing in front of the net, he wasn't covering Lawton, who was left wide alone to tap in the empty net goal. Although Lawton was left wide open on the play, it's tough to blame anybody on the play as it came on a switch. Weiss took the puck behind the net, and when he did that, Shabbat followed him. But once he got to a certain point, Shabbat had to let him go, allowing DeMello to meet him on the other side of the ice. When that happened, Shabbat moved back to the front of the net, but didn't see Lawton sneaking up behind him. The puck got through his feet, onto Lawton's stick, in the net. Not much you can really do on a poor switch. The third period comes, and the Flyers make it 5-3. Weiss's shot gets blocked. It lands on the stick of Raffle, who forces Anderson to chase him behind the net. When he does that, it leaves the front of the net wide open. Raffle finds Hag, who taps it into the empty net. 5-3 Flyers. That's just a cluster. Usually when your goalie ends up that far away from the goal, it ends up in a goal. Chris Weidman tried to make a save on the play, but he's no goalie. The Flyers have a 5-3 lead with just over 15 minutes remaining. Then, the Flyers go to the power play. You better believe we're going to be having a penalty chat at the end of this one. Giroux bangs home a puck that bounces off like four players, and the Flyers take a 6-3 lead. Again, power play, bouncing puck, broken play, not much of Sens could have done differently on that one. Remember the penalties I was talking about? Well, the Flyers take one, the Sens go to the power play, and they cut into the lead. Mad Max, the new repackaged one, jams home his second of the night on another puck that bounces off a couple guys, and the Sens cut the lead to two. What is going on with LeJoie? One year after scoring just once, he scores twice in one game and has three goals in his first four? It's honestly amazing to me that he struggled so much to score last season. When I watch him play, he strikes me as the kind of defenseman that could score a bunch. Does he have the best shot? No, not per se, but he seems to always put himself in the right areas. He has a nose for the net, and that's huge for the Sens, who are going to need their offense to come from not only their forwards, but also from their defensemen for the rest of this season. Then, the Sens pull their goalie, and the Flyers globetrot the puck around the Sens zone again, finally putting the puck in the back of the net to seal the 7-4 win, thanks to Scott Lawton's second of the night. Now, penalties. The game ended with 24 minor penalties, 12 on each team. Sure, it was called evenly, but it was called absolutely ridiculously. Full disclosure, I referee minor hockey. Having said that, I thought the officials last night did an awful job managing the game. Let's go through the Sens' early penalties. I thought Bodker, Weidman, and DeMello absolutely deserved their first period penalties. Six first period power plays is definitely excessive, but Ottawa did their part to earn them. The second was where the refs really lost me. That hit from Formanton and the way they responded really caused the refs more grief than they needed. Formanton hits a guy who is nowhere near the puck from behind. Naturally, the Flyers are going to defend their guy. When it is all said and done, the Sens end up with the power play? That's the wrong call in my opinion. At the very least, that needs to be an even up call if not a Flyers power play. 
the Flyers ended up getting the raw end of that deal in the sense that their guy got illegally hit and when they defended him, they ended up being punished for it. That caused the bad blood, which didn't soon go away. After serving a minor roughing penalty, Formanton returns to the ice a few minutes later. Hag goes after him and keeps whacking away. The referee lets it go until eventually all 10 guys in the ice are in a line brawl. Well, I wouldn't call it a brawl. More like line wrestling. Eventually, seven players make their way to the box. If the referees had have made the right call on the original Formanton hit, none of this probably would have happened. And if it did, had they originally called Formanton or Hag for a penalty on the play, the line wrestling wouldn't have broke out. They lost control. Then, to try to make it up to the Flyers, they called a phantom call on Dezingle. Calvin Pickard knocks the helmet off his own head and Dezingle goes to the box for goalie interference? Okay, sure. It was a tough night for the officials. But hey, that happens to everyone. The game's over, it didn't affect the outcome, so we move on. So let's do just that and move on. Let's move on to good news, bad news. The good news? I just talked about penalties, and the Sens were the beneficiaries of that. The club, which in past years was awful with the man advantage, finished the evening 3 for 7. A special shout out to the power play, which was especially efficient last night. Sometimes, power plays are as much about building momentum as they are about scoring goals, and that first Sens power play was an excellent momentum builder. The bad news? This team still has a lot of trouble defending. 20 goals against in 4 games? That's way too high. They can't defend right now, and honestly, it seems like they don't really want to. You saw last night a number of times, they were risking defensive plays for the offensive side of the puck. Fortunately, they have a coach in Guy Boucher who stresses structure and defensive hockey. They also have a young defensive core, so while that is a bad news right now, it could become good news or at least neutral news by the end of the season. Moving forward, the Sens take on the Los Angeles Kings on Saturday afternoon. The Kings come into today with a 1-1-1 record, having lost in overtime to San Jose, beating Detroit, and losing to Winnipeg. They play Montreal tonight before coming to Ottawa on Saturday. The Kings come in with offensive firepower of their own and a more than capable defensive core. What they don't have right now is an elite goalie because Jonathan Quick is out with a lower body injury. With Jack Campbell or Peter Budai expected to play in goal, it will be important for the Senators to put pressure on them early and make them feel uncomfortable. But, if they don't clean up their act defensively, it won't matter. They'll be outscored in another high-scoring offensive game. See you Saturday afternoon.